All right, as we go to Proverbs chapter 7, it's kind of interesting. It seems like right here in the middle of Proverbs, we kind of get this trilogy of this thought on the strange woman. And you know, tonight we're going to kind of finish up with this thought. Now this thought's finished in the, in the book of Proverbs and other places. But we kind of see in Proverbs chapter 5, in Proverbs chapter 6, in Proverbs chapter 7, it just keeps hammering on this point of this strange woman. It keeps talking about this strange woman. And it gives it a little bit different circumstances, a little bit of different perspective, different ways to look at it. But I think, honestly, it's just one of the things that affect young men so much that God wants to repeat it over and over and over. And it's important that we receive it every time so that we get it set on our heart. That's why it says at the very beginning, it says, My son, keep my words and lay up my commandments with thee. Keep my commandments and live. And my law is the apple of thine eye. Bind them upon thy fingers. Write them upon the table of thine heart. You know, sometimes when we get this language, we don't always just immediately apply it to practical wisdom. But what is he saying when he's saying, write it, write them upon the table of thine heart? He's talking about Bible memorization. He's talking about getting it written in your heart. How many things have you heard where someone, you know, could sit down and play on the piano and they say, oh, I know that song by what? By heart, right? I mean, so many times people learn things. Maybe they, they learn a famous poem. They say, oh, I know that by what? By heart. That's what the Bible is giving us this language of. He's saying he wants you to get the words of God written on your heart. He doesn't want you to just read your Bible and then close the book and be like, I don't even know what that said. No, he wants you to get them written on your heart. That's why he says, keep my words. How are you going to keep them? Well, you've got to get them memorized. He says, lay up my commandments with thee. He wants you to have them with you. How are you going to get them with you? Well, get them in your heart where it can store them, where it can keep them. Keep my commandments and live. And my law as the apple of thine eye. You know, I think there's this thing where a lot of people look at the, the do's and don'ts with a little bit of disdain. With a little bit of, you know, angst. They look at it as like, well, you know, it's just a bunch of rules. And, you know, I, I'll just do them because God said to do them. You know, God doesn't want you to have the perspective of, I'm just going to follow God's rules just because He said them. No, He wants them to be the apple of thine eye. He wants you to look at the law and think, wow, this is the greatest thing. When you see David, you see Solomon talking about the law, they're talking about wondrous things do I behold when I look at thy law. He's saying, look at all this great stuff. These rules are the greatest rules. This is the greatest righteousness. I mean, when we look at America today, we don't have God's laws as our laws, right? And don't you just read sometimes, and you're like, man, wouldn't that be great if that was our law? Right. Wouldn't it be great if all the murderers, and all the adulterers, and all the homos, and all these child molesters, weren't they just put to death? I mean, you look at that, and you're like, that's great. Amen. You know, and there's some things in the law that a lot of times will convict us in our heart. But if you want to really get to the next level, you're going to look at the law, you're going to look at the whole law, and that's going to be the apple of thine eye. You're not going to look at the law as just a bunch of rules. You're going to look like, I want to do that. I think that's the greatest thing to do, is to follow the laws of God. I love the laws. That's why it says, great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. When you have God's laws as the apple of your eye, when you love God's laws, nothing will offend you. You know, it says, it's talking about these words. And if we go just a couple more verses, it says, say unto wisdom, Thou art my sister, and call understanding thy kinswomen, that they may keep thee from the strange woman, from the stranger which flattereth with her words. Now we already get a, a kind of this battle. We have the words of God that he wants you to write in your heart, and then we have the words from the strange woman. Why? Because your whole life is a battle of words. Your whole life, there's this battle. Do you want God's word to be written on your heart? Or do you want man's word? Do you want the wisdom of this world? Or do you want the wisdom of God? And you're going to be filled. You're going to be affected by words. I don't care who you are, what you do, words are going to affect you. Are you going to let the words of this world affect you? Are you going to let the strange woman affect you? Or are you going to let God's words affect you? But there's no person that's not affected by words. The Bible says, be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Why? Because have you ever been around somebody and maybe they had a real filthy mouth? They had a real perverted mouth? And maybe you had to work with this person. Or maybe it was a family member. Or maybe it was just somebody that you're around a lot. And then after a while, 
one time you just let something kind of slip. You're like, where did that come from? Because when you're surrounded by evil words, when you're surrounded by certain words, they're going to affect you. And when you're surrounded by God's words, they're going to affect you too. But you have a choice in this life. What words are you going to let affect you? What words are going to determine your life? You know, the Bible says, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. How do you get saved? By the Word of God. The Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Words is everything. In this world, you're affected by what you say. You're affected by what you hear. This whole life is about the words. And that's why I don't think you should turn on the TV. That's why I don't think you should listen to secular music. Why? You can't listen to that garbage. You can't fill yourself with all these wicked, evil words and it not affect you. I don't care who you are. That's why Pastor Anderson, I heard him say a lot of times, and I think it's right. If you pay attention to the music today, it's all about dating. It's all about, you know, finding that next woman. You know, filling that, that first rush when you're on that first date. And that's why there's so much adultery. That's why there's so much fornication. That's why there's so much stimulation for people who want to do that because they're hearing these words over and over and over and they just think, oh man, I want to do that. Why do you think gangsters listen to this gangster rap talking about murder and killing and then they go out and murder and kill? Why? It helps build them up. It helps rev them up. Why is it so important that we sing a hymn when we go out soloing? Because it's going to give you that boldness. If you can sit there and sing the praises of God, if you can sing salvation... You can go to someone and just tell them. I mean, is it easier to just tell someone the Bible or to actually just sing it boldly? It's actually easier just to tell it. That's why when you're filled with the Spirit, when you're filled with singing praises, it'll give you that extra boldness when you're out preaching the Word of God. I think it's very important, if you can, to sing a hymn before you go soul winning. Maybe you're just on your way when you're walking to the, the door. But it'll give you that boldness. Because words matter. And there's a battle in this chapter. The Word of God... And the flattering words of the woman, the strange woman. And we see here, does it say that she comes, you know, preaching some kind of hate-filled message, some kind of evil message? No, it says flattering. I mean, the devil doesn't come to you and just say, hey, you want to go to hell and burn in eternity forever? No, he's coming enticing. He's coming with some kind of promise. He's coming with something good. And this strange woman is the same way. She's not coming to you in some, you know, evil words or some destructive words. She's coming with flattery. She's going to tell you how great you are, how wonderful you are. So we'll go, we'll go and look at what some of these words are. We have in verse 6, it says, For at the window of my house I looked through my casement and beheld among the simple ones. I discerned among the youths a man void of understanding, passing through the street near her corner. And he went the way to her house in the twilight in the evening, in the black and dark night. So we have a lot of things here. But we have a, a young man who's being enticed by this strange woman. And we see he's actually seeking her out. He's passing through the street near her corner. Why is it her corner? He knows where he's going. He's going to her corner. He's going to the way to her house. If y'all turn to Psalms 119. Now why is this guy going here? It kind of tells us in verse 7, it said, a man void, a young man void of understanding. And as you're turning to Psalms 119, I want to really focus on this being void of understanding. And I'll read you one verse before you get there. It says in Psalms 32, 9, it says, And I will instruct thee and teach thee the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Be not as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. God says, look, if you obey my words, you can guide yourself. You can guide yourself with my words. You can be free to go. But those that are void of understanding, they actually need a bridle. They need a bit in their mouth, and they're going to be led about, and they don't even know where they're going. They have no understanding. They're just going to go where whatever's leading them. Whatever song's on the radio, oh, I'm going to go to this song. I'm going to do what this song's saying. Oh, there's a movie. Oh, I'm going to do this movie. Oh, there's this strange woman coming. I'm just going to follow her. They're just being led about like a dumb animal because they have no understanding. They don't know what the Bible says. They have nowhere else to go. They're just going to be influenced and led by what's in their life, by the people that come into their life, by the things that they led into their life. They're just led about as a dumb animal. So in Psalms 119, we're going to look at a lot of verses in here. This is such a great chapter of the Bible. 
It, it really emphasizes the Word of God in Psalms 119. And there's a lot of different pieces to it, but we're going to really look at the word understanding. It says in verse 34, Give me understanding, and I shall keep thy law. Yea, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Flip down to verse 73. It says, Thy hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn thy commandments. We need understanding to learn God's word. Go down to verse 99. It says, I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. We see that David was saying because he studied the word of God so much, he had the greatest understanding. You want to have the best understanding of all the men in this world? Meditate on His Word. Memorize His Word. You know the best teachers in the world today? Those that have the words of God written on the table of their heart. And that could be anybody. There's nothing stopping you from memorizing this book but yourself. Amen. It's Amen. you and the Bible in endless opportunity. You can have the greatest understanding in this world if you write the words of God on your heart. That's what David's saying. He became more wise. He had more understanding than all his teachers. Why? Because his testimonies was his meditation. He didn't waste his time on vain things. He wasted his time on the Bible. He spent all of his extra time on the Bible. We looked at verse 104. It says, Through thy precepts I get understanding. The only way you're going to get understanding is from his word. He says, Therefore I hate every false way. What's the false way? Every other way. He hates them because they don't give you understanding. They're going to trick you. They're going to deceive you. That's why he hates all the false ways because he knows the only way to get understanding is from this book. It's from God. It's from His voice. In verse 125 it says, I am thy servant. Give me understanding that I may know thy testimonies. If you want to have full understanding of the Bible, you have to read it and let God give you that understanding. And He'll give it to you if you ask Him. If you let the Holy Spirit guide you. In verse 130 it says, The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. Now when he was looking at verse 7, you don't have to flip back there because we're going to stay in Psalms 119, just a few more verses. But he said, I beheld among the simple ones, I discerned among the youth a young man void of understanding. So the Bible contrasts here in 130 even, that someone that doesn't have understanding is what the Bible calls is simple. Meaning they're ignorant, meaning they're foolish, meaning they have no knowledge. This is just anybody that doesn't have any of the words of God. Saved or unsaved. If you don't have the words of God, you have no understanding. You're simple-minded, ignorant, foolish, stupid, whatever you want to call it. You have no understanding if you don't have this book. If you don't know anything in this book, you're simple. You know, I've heard a lot of people say, I've never read the Bible. Automatically simple. I don't care how smart they are. I don't care how many degrees they have on the wall. I don't care how great they are at solving problems or knowing math or science or whatever. They're simple-minded. You know, and I work with a lot of very what we would call intelligent people. Computer programmers, that they know so much about computer programming. They can write all kinds of programs. They have complex understanding of algorithms and mathematics. They have all this understanding, but they're so simple-minded. You know what they love? They love Pokemon Go. You know what they love? I mean, they love Star Trek. They love chasing all these stupid things. They think that robots will become humans. Because they're so simple-minded. They think that somehow man is going to create eternal life by medicine or by robots or whatever. They think that we're going to live on other planets and, you know, live in like this Star Trek world. I mean, they're so simple-minded. And, you know, a lot of times they're looking for the right thing. They're looking for eternal life. They're looking for the things that every man wants. Every man wants to live an eternal life. They just don't realize it's in this book. And they're so simple-minded if they don't have this book. I don't care how intelligent or what their IQ is. If you don't have this book, you're simple, according to the Bible. If you look at 144, it says, The righteous of thy testimonies is everlasting. Give me understanding, and I shall live. Look at 169. That's one we'll look at in Psalms 119. It says, Let me come near before thee, O Lord. Give me understanding according to thy word. So, of course, you could have understanding of other topics. Like, you could have understanding, like, how to fix a car. You know, how to, how to, how to play the piano. You could have understanding in vain things or, or, or things that, like, according to your job. But what's the understanding that God's talking about in all this context? He's talking about understanding according to His Word. Understanding that's eternal. Understanding that has meaning in this life. And that's the understanding that we should seek after. 
Y'all turn to Matthew chapter 15. I want to look at a couple more places. I really want to hammer in this point of talking about understanding. Because we see the whole premise, the whole falling of this guy is because he was void of understanding. He went to her house. He's going after her house because he's simple-minded. Because he doesn't have any understanding. And we look at Matthew chapter 15 and verse 12. The Bible says, Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Declare unto us this parable. And Jesus said, Are ye also yet without understanding? So I see that, that Jesus, you know, he rebuked Peter for not having understanding. But the point that I want to draw out of this, was Jesus surprised that the Pharisees had no understanding? No. I mean, he's like, are ye also without understanding? He was like, they are obviously without understanding because they're blind. They're blind leading the blind. So even the Pharisees, who knew a lot about the Bible, according to Jesus, had no understanding. Why? Because you do have to be saved to get that understanding. You have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be filled with the Holy Spirit to get understanding. That's why there's two people that are simple-minded. The first people are those that have no knowledge of the Bible. It doesn't matter if they're saved. It doesn't matter if they're not saved. According to the Bible, they have no understanding. And then the second group would be those that maybe they have knowledge of the Bible, but they are not saved. Both of these people would always be simple. And I'll give you a couple of verses. You don't have to turn there. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17, it says, Wherefore, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Now, how do you know what the will of the Lord is? By reading this book. By getting it from His Word. So if you don't have that, if you don't have that understanding, you're unwise according to Jesus Christ. Meaning that you're simple-minded. In 1 Timothy 1.7, it says, Desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say, nor whereof they affirm. So we see false preachers. People that maybe know a lot about the Bible as far as they could recite it or they've read it. The Bible says that they have no understanding because they're not saved. Someone that's not saved, they have no idea what they're saying. They can say the right thing, but they don't understand what they're saying. And many times they're going to say bad things. And they're not going to be able to affirm correctly. They might be like, yeah, I think there's eternal life. Yeah, I'm pretty sure, but they don't really know because they have no understanding because they're not saved. So we go back to verse 7. Let's go back to Proverbs. I just wanted to get a little bit more concentration on what it meant to be simple. What it meant to be a young man void of understanding. We now see that it's someone who's not saved every time. But even if they were unsaved, it's someone that has no knowledge of the Bible. Someone that's not seeking the Word of God. And this fits a lot of people in today's world. Amen. It says in verse 7, it says, And beheld among the simple ones, I discerned among the youths a young man void of understanding, passing through the street near her corner, and he went the way to her house. Now that we have that description, how many guys that you know, or maybe you grew up with, you went to school with, they're not saved, they don't know anything in the Bible, that the one thing they're chasing is the strange woman. I mean, all they want is to have that girlfriend. They're just chasing that girl. That's all they want because they have no understanding. They're like a dumb animal. They're just being led about by this strange woman. And we see that's what they're seeking. And you know, there's this lie that's kind of purported by these people. They say, oh man, you want to settle down and get married and just be with one woman? They're like, isn't that awful? Wouldn't that be so terrible to just be with one woman for the rest of your life? No, I think that's great. No, I think that's wonderful. You know, I think it would be horrible if I was with any other woman. I think it would be terrible if I had to share that relationship with another man. Because you have to look at it on both sides, my friend. You can't just look at it from a selfish perspective of, oh, I'm going to get to, you know, have my cake and eat it too, but my wife has to be pure. No, or my girlfriend has to be pure. But, you know, it's such a lie to think, oh, if I sleep with as many women as I can, if I lie with as many women as I can, that will be the best. That will give me the most satisfaction in this life. It's a lie. After being married, after going through this lie, and sometimes feeling like, oh man, maybe that, that does kind of sound right. It's such a lie. All I want is to be pure with my wife for the rest of my life. That is the greatest thing that I can think of in our marriage, is for us to just be pure unto one another. 
to be true to one another. And I have no uh, doubt that I'm going to have the most fulfillment with just my wife, with just that one woman. And we see the lie of the man, the lie that so many people try to say is to sleep with multiple women. But you're going to be full of grief, unsatisfaction, possibly disease, regret. We see so many blended families. We see so much destruction. We see so many people torn apart. We see so many children without fathers, without mothers. Why? Because of this lie. You need to find one woman and stick with her and you'll have the most fulfillment. I promise you that. You should have that pure, unique, and righteous relationship that God wants. But we see that this, this unlearned man, this simple-minded man, this man void of understanding, he doesn't get that. He doesn't understand that. So what is he doing? He's going to her corner. He's going to her house. So now we're going to change gears a little bit. Now we're going to focus on this woman. Is this guy going to just some random girl? No, he's going to a girl with a reputation, isn't he? He's going for that girl where that's her corner, where it's her house. Everybody knows that it's her house. And maybe if you went to public school like I did, there are some girls that you're like, that's that girl, you know, or that's that girl. You know, as young women, you should not desire to have that type of reputation. You should not desire to have all these dumb animal men chasing after you. And let's look at the last verse that I read there in this passage. It says, In the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. So you see, God says it a lot of different ways. He's making an emphasis that it's dark. Why? Because there's such a contrast in the Bible of light and dark. Turn to John chapter 3. What, is the, what would be a parallel today of the darkness? How much of this sin, of men chasing after this loose woman, happen in the dark? They happen in what? Clubs? in the bars, at night. Why? Because men know that it's wrong. Even in their heart, even though they're, they're kind of being led astray, even though they don't really have a lot of understanding, the law of God's written on their heart and they know that it's wrong and they're going to do it in the dark. That's when you go to these nasty, disgusting clubs and bars where it's so filthy and disgusting. If they shine the light, you would like want to run away. If you were sober and you were in the light in these bars and these clubs, you'd be like, this is so disgusting. This is so rank. I mean, it makes trailer parks, the trailer park areas look like really nice. These bars and these clubs, it's such a lie. That's why I have to turn down the lights. They have to get it really dark and then they flash all these bright lights and they got music pounding and they get you so drunk. You don't realize that you're in a disgusting, filthy, wicked place. And that's where these men go to find this loose women. And they can be found on every corner. But in John chapter 3, it says, For God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son of the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. The light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. So we see, why is this guy going in the dark? Because he knows it's wrong, but he doesn't want to be exposed by the light. And so many men are content by chasing this woman in the darkness and they don't want to come to the light. You go out in the streets and you say, hey, we're just inviting people to church. If you die today, you're 100% sure you go to heaven? No. Well, if I could show you, would you want to know? Nope. I don't want to know. Why? Because they love darkness. Because they love their sin. Because they want to chase after this strange woman. Because they've been so enticed by her flattering words that they just want to seek after that. And they're just locked on that. That's why this sin is so big. Flee fornication. Why does it talk about destroying your life? Why does it talk about hell? Because men that get entrapped in this, men that think this is their whole life, they're going to go, they're just, it's like a vector beam. They're just sucked in. They're just going to go straight to hell. Why? Because they don't care about anything else. They love this sin. They love this wickedness. And they're going to perform it in the dark. Don't be deceived. Never go to these clubs. Never go to these bars. Why? Because you're going to get enticed by this flattering woman. You're going to be enticed by these words. 
And it can affect so many men. It can affect anybody. And they can get sucked in this tractor beam. And it can just destroy your life. It can get you to the point where you're so apathetic. You don't want to hear God's word. You just love the darkness more than the light. And you know, that's why I picked up this uh, article. Some of you all probably may have heard it. It's talking about this Minister Gigaba. This article is titled, Home Affairs Minister is Using State Resources to Commit Adultery and Infidelity. It says in the article, the publication titled EFF Statement on Malusi Gigaba's Usage of State Resources to Commit Adultery and Infidelity, stated in its first paragraph that the EFF notes the reports about the philandering ways of Home Affairs Minister Malusi Gigaba. We do not care much about the minister's affairs and infidelity because he is renowned for using government's credit card and money to buy flowers for his girlfriends, breaking people's families, and engaging in unacceptable extramarital practices. Now, the beginning of this article, this is what they're saying. They're saying this gigabug, he goes and sleeps around with so many women, he destroys so many families and marriages that he's renowned. And you know, this article's like, we don't, we're not even going to like talk about that because just everybody realizes it. Everybody knows. But what they're going to pick apart is the fact that he's using government money to do this. And it says in the, in the article, I didn't have it in my notes, but it was like, 7,000 of their currency, which translates to about, or 700,000, I think, translates to about 5,000 American dollars. So at one time, he's spending up to $5,000 on these extramarital affairs, potentially. Now, in this article, they don't go up to say as much that they could prove that he's been spending this money, but they're like, without a doubt, we know that he's just an adulterer. He's committing all this fornication. It says if the reports about his infidelity and money transfers are true, the statement reads, it means that Malusi is involved in money laundering, and even involve state sec security officials to facilitate what is patently illegal money movements. The party has such vowed in the last paragraph of its statement to write a state secretary department, SARS, and all the relevant authorities to request for a thorough investigation of a minister who uses state resources for marital infidelity and money laundering. Now, I hope that's true. I hope he does get investigated. I hope that the light gets shined on his darkness for his wickedness. And now we have a little better idea why he doesn't want a man of God coming to his country to preach the word of God, to get people saved, so that they have understanding of this word, and they realize that he's a wicked man. Amen. Amen. Now we're going to turn to uh, Matthew chapter 14, and we're going to see the same thing. We're going to see that all these wicked guys are the same. This gigabuzz is not something new. There's no new thing under the sun. But we see in Matthew chapter 14 and verse 1, the Bible says, At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard of the fame of Jesus. And he said unto his servants, This is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. For Herod had laid hold on John, and bound him, and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. For John said unto them, It is not lawful for thee to have her. And when he would have put him to death, he feared the multitude, because they counted him as a prophet. Now, sometimes when I was reading this story, when I was thinking, reflecting on this story, I kind of got it backwards. I thought that he decided he wasn't going to kill him because he thought he was a prophet. But that's not what the Bible says. It says he wanted to kill him, but he feared the people, and that's why they didn't kill him. Now, Pastor Anderson had gone to South Africa. I'm pretty sure this gig of him, I wanted to have killed Pastor Anderson. Now, would he have feared the people? No, I mean, the people seem to be all in agreement. Yeah. They hated his guts. Maybe God didn't let Pastor Anderson in this country to protect him from the danger that he was in. And I hope to God that Mr. Gigaba gets what he deserves, and maybe a righteous guy can get lifted up in South Africa, and maybe the gospel can come to South Africa. Because those souls are so precious. And we shouldn't look at them like Nineveh and say, oh, I hope they all burn and go to hell. No, we should hope that they do get the gospel. We should hope that they do get saved. We should, I mean, 60,000 people is like a drop of water on 500 million. I mean, that's nothing. You don't want to condemn a whole nation just because of these reprobates, because of these wicked people, because of people like Gigaba. But we should want them to get the word of God. And if we turn back to Proverbs, I'm going to read you one last place. It says in Psalms 12, verse 6, I love this place in the Bible. It says, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. 
Isn't that what we see in today's culture? Isn't that what we see in this world? That the vilest men are exalted. And what happens? The wicked walk on every side. When you give them an inch, they're going to take a mile. When you praise these wicked transgender, these freaks, these reprobates, you're going to have wicked men walking on every side. Why has South Africa got so much wickedness? Because they're exalting vile, wicked men. They have people like this Gigaba. I mean, this Gigaba is so wicked. He should be punished for his deeds. We see that he's praising the homosexual. He's praising the transgender. And that's why I have all these wicked people walking on every side. And we see there's a contrast there. He's saying the words of the Lord are pure words. When we're looking at God's words, when we're lifting up God's words, the wicked aren't going to rule in this world. They're not going to be walking down every side. They're going to be hiding in the corners. They're going to be put to death. But when the words change, when the words change, lifting up vile people and not God, then the wicked walk everywhere. Why? Because words affect this life. That's why we need to go out and preach the gospel. That's why we need more preachers in this country, because words matter. Amen. You say, oh, well, I don't care about all the other cities in America. You should, because they're going to get worse and worse and worse as long as there's not a man of God preaching the word of God, building up people and teaching them all things whatsoever he commanded them, right? We need righteousness to be preached. We need the whole Bible to be preached. We need God's word to be lifted up to affect men's hearts. Why do men's hearts get changed? Because they fear God. Because they fear His Word. You're not going to fear God by just sitting around doing nothing. You're only going to fear God by Bible preaching, by reading the Word of God, by getting the words of God written on your heart. Let's turn back to Proverbs chapter 10. Or Proverbs chapter 7, verse 10. It says, And behold, there met with him a woman with the attire of a harlot and subtle of heart. She is loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. So we see the attire of a harlot. What is that? Well, in Exodus chapter 28, you don't have to turn there. Turn to Isaiah chapter 47. Isaiah chapter 47. In Exodus 28, in verse 42, the Bible says, And thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness. From the loins, even unto the thighs, they shall reach. How do you describe nakedness according to the Bible? Well, according to Jesus Christ, it's from your loins unto your thighs. So if you have any part of this body exposed, a male or female... It's nakedness according to the Bible. And if we look at Isaiah 47 verse 2, it says, Take the millstones and grind the meal. Uncover thy locks. Make bare the leg. Uncover the thigh. Pass over the rivers. Thy nakedness shall be uncovered. Yea, thy shame shall be seen. I will take vengeance, and I will not meet thee as a man. So here we have another description. He's saying, Uncover your thigh, and he's going to be exposing your nakedness. Now, you, sometimes you have a confusion. People don't understand the word naked. They think naked is when you're just completely unclothed. Like all of your body is exposed. Well, when the Bible talks about someone like that, it's bare. Or bare naked. Maybe you've heard that. But to be naked just means you're exposing some part of your body that you shouldn't. And anybody that's exposing this part of their body is naked. And you don't have to be completely uncovered. But if you're exposing any part of your body, your loins, you know, even the plumber's crack, that's nakedness, my friend. And I don't want to see it. But we see that the definition of the attire of a harlot, what is it? It's someone that's naked. She's naked in some way. And a lot of harlots back in those days, they were harlots because they had a slit in their dress and they would expose part of their thigh. That would be the, how you would, oh, that's the attire of a harlot. And now that doesn't mean that every woman that's dressed like that is a harlot. Because in this description, it's just saying she's in the attire. But any woman or any man at any time could be dressed like a whore or a whoremonger. And if you're exposing your thigh, if you're exposing part of your body that you shouldn't, you're in the attire of a harlot according to the Bible. So we see this woman, she knows what she's doing. She's coming in the attire of a harlot and says, subtle of heart. Now in Genesis chapter 3, we had uh, Satan. And it said that he was more subtle than any beast of the field. You don't have to turn there. Turn if you would to... Uh, 1 Peter chapter 3. What does it mean that she's subtle of heart? Well, I think that, honestly, in this, in this case, there is some really wicked women that just want to destroy your life. But I think, honestly, she's deceived in her heart. The Bible says, uh, let me figure in my notes. I don't have it. It says, the heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked who can know it, right? This woman doesn't understand that her heart is deceitful. You know, she, she one moment wants this guy, and so she chases after him. And then the next moment she wants this guy, 
She's subtle of heart in the fact that her heart can change at any moment and you have no idea. She could give you all of her heart. She could say it with her mouth, but then she wouldn't mean it and her heart would change. She's subtle of heart. And in 1 Peter chapter 3, the Bible says, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. Now there I think it means everything. It means your words. It means how you live your life. In, in the passage that we read, she said she is loud and stubborn. The opposite of this attire of the harlot, this strange woman, is a woman that would have meek conversation. Flip down to verse 4. It says, But let it be the hidden, heart of the, uh, the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God a great price. God makes a great distinction in the Bible. A loud and stubborn woman is a woman that you should avoid. Every single time. The Bible looks at a godly woman as a woman that's quiet and meek. Why? Because she's supposed to help be a help me. Because she's supposed to be subject under her husband. And a loud and stubborn woman is never going to be that kind of a woman. And it says her feet abide not in her house. Well, we know that the woman is supposed to be in the house. I'm going to give you a few uh, statistics and then we'll flip to a couple of verses. Go to Proverbs chapter 14. It says in 1950 that 34% of women worked a secular job. So not even that long ago, about a third of women went outside the home and worked some type of secular job. Now this wasn't just all full-time work, this was just any kind of secular job. And by 1988, 60% of women worked a secular job. So we see a pretty big increase, almost double. And it says the ages were tracked in this. When they looked at younger women, like the ages of 25 to 34, it went from 34% to 76.3%. I mean, three out of four women that are young are working some kind of secular job. Said in 1967, there's about 14 million women that were workers. And by 2009, it was about 43 million. I mean, just huge spikes in the amount of women in the workforce. And you say, well, what's the result of that? Well, in 1950, divorce was about 25%. Now, it's still starting to get kind of some, uh, some momentum. It was starting to kind of build. But then we see women, you know, they were in the workplace. I mean, there's still some decent, a decent percentage of women in the workplace. But then it just skyrocketed. And we see almost directly proportional. From 1950s, it, it doubled the amount of women working in the workplace. And divorce, guess what? Doubled. It went all the way to 50%. And it says adultery in 1950 was about 9%. So this, you know, you can't track adultery perfectly. I mean, you could look at a lot of different statistics, but this one said that they tracked it and felt like about 1950s or about 9% adultery. And now in the country, it's about 33% for men and almost 25% for women. Why is this? Because when you have the men and the women in the workplace, when you have these women that are flattering men with their lips, you're going to have an increase in this adultery. In Proverbs chapter 14, it says every wise woman buildeth her house, but the foolish plucketh it down with her hands. It says in Titus 2, 5, you want to turn there, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. You know, the thing about women is when they're not abiding in their house, this adultery is going to cause rampant. They're a weaker vessel. When they're going into these men, when they're flattering them with their tongues, you're going to see all this adultery. You're going to see all this divorce. That's why women should be keepers at home. They need to be in their homes that the word of God be not blasphemed. That they can be subject unto their own husbands. That they don't get distracted. I mean, what happened to Adam? Why did he sin? Because his wife enticed him, right? Why did Samson get destroyed? Because Delilah enticed him. When you put the woman there with the man, she's going to entice him. And she's going to lead him into sin. Why? I, I can't describe why God made men and women the way they are, but it's just a reality. That women out in the workplace, that women not at home, not raising the children, mischief will happen. Be not deceived. These women are going to go out, and they're going to be flirting with the men. The men are going to be flirting with the women. And the women are going to entice these men. If we look at verse 12, it says, now she is without, now in the streets, and lieth and waited at every corner. We see that prostitution is rampant in this country. These women in the, the, in the attire of a harlot are everywhere. In Cambodia, this is the country that had the most prostitution. It's averaged between 59 to 80% of men have committed prostitution in Cambodia. 
Can you imagine? I mean, the high number is 80% of men have committed prostitution. In Thailand, it's up to 75%. In Italy, it's ranged from 16 to 45%. In Spain, it's 27 to 39%. In Japan, it's about 37%. In the Netherlands, it's like 13 to 21%. In the United States, it's estimated between 15 and 20% of men have committed some type of prostitution. So we see this isn't just some small matter. This is a matter that affects a lot of men. And when they know where her corner is, when they know where her, her house is, they're going to go after it. These men without any understanding, these simple-minded men, they're going to just chase this woman. Let's continue with our text. It says, So she caught him and kissed him, and with an impudent face said unto him, I have peace offerings with me this day. Have I paid my vows? Therefore came I forth to meet thee, diligently to seek thy face. And I have found thee. I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, with carved works, with fine linen of Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with loves. For the good man is not at home. He has gone a long journey. He hath taken a bag of money with him, and will come home at the day appointed. With her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. With her flattering of her lips, she forced him. He goeth after her straightway, as an ox goeth to the slaughter. Or is a fool to the correction of the stocks, till a dart strike through his liver, as a bird hasteneth to the snare, and knoweth not that it is for his life. So we see going back up to the verse 13, it says that she caught him and she kissed him. A woman that will go up to a strange man and just kiss him is a harlot, is a whore. You don't want to marry this woman. You don't want to marry a forward woman that would just come up and kiss the strange man. And you know it's very flattering. Wouldn't it be flattering for some young, attractive woman to just come right up to you and kiss you? I mean, that would be very flattering. You'd be like, wow, she must think I'm pretty attractive. I mean, she just came up and gave me a kiss. But this strange woman, if she would just walk up and give you a kiss, she'll do it to any guy. Right. And you know, it's such a lie. There's this lie that, you know, I didn't quite understand. That there's so many women that will kiss any man. They will lie with any man. They will hunt for any man. And you need to understand that this woman that's coming after you, there's nothing special about you. There's nothing that she's looking at you and saying, oh man, this guy's so much better. You know, there's these, this strange woman, she looks at tons of guys and is like, I would lie with any of them. I would kiss any of them. I, they're just boy crazy. You know, and this thing is such a lie. They're in the schools. You have these young girls that are like, I'm so boy crazy. I like Thomas, and I like Billy, and I like Johnny, and I like, you know, they like all of them. And this strange woman will kiss any guy. And there's a lot of women in this world that will, that will lie with you, that will go after you without much effort. And you need to not be deceived. This woman's out there. And if this woman's coming to you, you need to run. You need to flee. And you need to look for a wife that would never do this. Why? Because you want a woman that's going to hold herself as precious, hold herself as valuable. She's not just going to give herself to any guy that passes by. You know, and if some woman is, is willing to just make out with you or, or lie with you the first time that you meet her, never a woman that you should be with. That should be a red flag. If this woman's even hinting at it, if this woman's even wanting it, that's why I think on a first date or a first few dates, you should just make your intentions clear. You know, if a young woman came unto a young man and said, look, I'm not, I'm going to keep myself pure before marriage. I'm not going to just lie with any guy. And I want you to know, I'm only going to stay in the public I'm not going to go into these dark places. All of these guys that are hunting for her, they're going to run. They're going to be like, oh, this isn't her. I need to go to her court. I need to go to her house. But, you know, young women are deceived. They think if they told some guy, they're like, oh, you know, I don't want to do that before I get married, that they would leave, that that's a bad thing. No. You want all those wolves and dumb animals and losers to just leave. But, you know, a righteous guy, you know, a righteous man, if he came unto a young woman and she told that to him, that wouldn't scare him. That wouldn't frighten him. You know, if you really like a girl, you're going to keep dating her, whether or not she's going to lie with you or not. And you know, that would even be more attractive that the woman would already be saying that. And you know, just as she would say that, you should say that unto women. Because this strange woman, once you tell her that, she's like, ooh, I'm not really looking for commitment. Ooh, I don't know if I want to define this, you know. And they're just going to move on to the next guy. That's just going to satisfy her in that moment. Says she, she caught him with an impudent face, said unto him, I have peace offerings with me. This day have I paid my vows. 
What does impudent mean? It means not showing uh, due respect, being impertinent. You know, I think this woman, and I think unfortunately a lot of women, they're not really atheists. I think a woman being an atheist is kind of a rarity. They, they realize there's a God. You know, women are so much more reliant on men just naturally. I think they have a harder time being an atheist, so they understand there's a God. And they know that what they're doing is wicked. So a lot of times they have to justify their sin. You know, and unfortunately, prostitution is such a horrible thing, and we know there's a lot of women that are forced into it, but there's a lot of women that go into it and justify it. And they say, oh man, I just need the money. Oh, I'm a single mother. You know, and so they say, well, God's just going to forgive me for this time. You know, God's just going to pardon me because He knows I'm struggling. I really need this money. You should never justify prostitution. You should never justify sin. You should never justify your wickedness. And we see this woman, she's just saying with an impudent face, Oh, I have my peace offerings with me today. This day have I paid my vows. She's just kind of saying, Oh, she's just trying to justify it. She's like, God knows what I'm doing. It says, Therefore came I forth to meet thee, diligently to seek thy face, and I found thee. Just as much as this guy is going to her corner, she's going after him. And you should not look for the forward woman. You should not look for the woman that's rude in her speech, crude in her behavior, that's just coming on to you really strong. That's not the type of woman that you should look for. You should look for the quiet and meek spirit. God always contrasts those two things very sharply. Now if we go to verse 15, it says, oh, let's go to verse 16. It says, I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, with carved works, with fine linen of Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh and aloes and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with loves. For the good man is not at home. He has gone a long journey. He hath taken a bag of money with him and will come home at the day appointed. We see in both this situation, the woman and the man, they're not stumbling upon this sin. They both thought it out. They planned this sin out. This guy knows where he's going. He knows what house he's going to. He's making sure to go in the dark. He's making sure to go at night. We see this woman. She's decked her bed. She's already ready to commit this fornication. She didn't know he was coming. She just knew that some guy was coming. And she's going to take the next sucker, the next loser, the next simple-minded, dumb, idiotic fool that doesn't realize the death and destruction of this sin. If we go down to uh, verse chapter 20, it says, or verse 19, back up. It says, For the good man is not at home. He is gone on a long journey. Now in this story, I don't think that you could definitively decide whether or not this woman was a daughter or a wife. I think that you could look at it in both ways. And I think God gives us the ability to look at it from both scenarios. But just as much as uh, in both these situations, we see that this good man's not home, which allows this situation. Which allows this woman to not abide in her house. You know, nothing good happens after 10 p.m. That's an old saying that a lot of people say, right? But why in the world would you let your daughter out at night at 10 p.m.? Why would you let your wife out at night at 10 p.m.? Where is she going to go? What good is she going to do? We see as a man of God, as the good men of the house, it's so foolish to let your daughter just go out with the men. Just go out with the women. Go out into this world. They're going to commit fornication. They're going to get taken advantage of. They're going to go out into all kinds of sin and wickedness. And it's so foolish for men to let their daughters out until what? 11 to 12 to 1 at night. I guarantee if you let your daughter out in this night, if you let her out into this world, dressed in the attire of a harlot, sin's going to happen. Why? We look in this world, it's like 97% of people are not pure on their wedding day. Why? Because they're going out of their house. Because the good man's not home. Where is the good man in this situation? As men, when you become a father, you need to keep your, your wife and your daughter at home. You need to keep her under your protection. Because when she goes out, especially dressed in the attire of a harlot, bad things are going to happen. That man's going to find her, and he's going to lie with her. And he's going on a long journey. You know, I'm not going to criticize some guy if he has some job where he has to travel a long distance every once in a while. But to me, it doesn't seem wise. It doesn't seem wise for the father to not be present in the house. We see that when the, the cat's away, the mice will play. We see that the women, they're, they're going to be going out looking for it if the man's not there. She knows that the good man's not at home, so mischief can take place. And we as young men, you know, I don't think, if there was a job, and it was going to pay a lot of money, but I was going to be away from my family, I would never take it. 
I just don't, it's not important to me to make a whole bunch of money and to not be there for my wife, to not be there for my daughter. And we can learn from this good man of the house, when he's gone, look at the sin and the wickedness happening. And so much more of it was his wife, right? I mean, this wife going out and saying, oh, my husband's not going to be here for a long time. I've decked my bed. Let's fill ourselves with love. And she's causing him to yield by her fair speech, as we see in chapter 21. And it's all about the words. And it says, does she come to him just saying, hey, let's, you know, cause death and destruction. Let's cause misery under our family members. No, she's causing him to yield by her fair speech. You're always going to be enticed by sin by the fair speech. And it says she caused him to yield with the flattering of her lips. She forced him. You know, how many movies, I don't know if you saw any movies, I, I unfortunately saw a lot of movies growing up. It's really wicked, I don't think you should watch anything. But all of the time you'd see this hero, you'd see this main, main character, the man, and you'd see this woman come, and she'd whisper in the guy's ear, and what would happen? He would always yield unto the woman. Woman has a great power with her lips. There's a lot of women, if they're put in the situation with a man, when they whisper in the guy's ear, she can force him to do whatever she wants. We see many strong men, many godly men, many men that aren't godly. When this woman gets to whisper in your ear, when she's flattering with your lips, when she's telling you all the things that you want to hear, you're going to get to the point where you're forced. And I don't care how much you've read the Bible. I don't care how much you're being filled with the Spirit. If you get put yourself in the wrong situation with the wrong woman, and she's saying all the right things, you're going to fall. You're going to fall, stumble into that temptation. That's why you need to just avoid this situation. Don't even go near her house. Don't even come anywhere near her. Don't let her get into your ear. Don't let her flatter with your lips. Don't get in some private situation, some dark situation with another woman where she can start whispering in your ear. Because she's going to get to the point where she could even force you. And you say, oh, I would never do that. What about Samson? I mean, a strong man. How in the world, when she keeps telling him, like, what's your strength? And he tells her and she just betrays him over and over and over. But we see he's almost like he's forced. What happened with Adam? I mean, he was forced by his wife, I believe. I mean, when you have that marriage, when you have, when you have a relationship with a woman, when you're enticed by this woman, if she whispers the right things in your ear, you'll be forced. I mean, you, I don't care who it is in this world. You take the president, you take these strong men, there's, there's women that can come into their life and put in the right situation, they would fall. They would stumble. That's why you should just avoid those situations. There's certain places that you just shouldn't go. Just like a drunk can't go into a bar, just like a drug addict can't go into a drug house, a young man should never be around this strange woman where she can whisper into your ear. Be not deceived. I'm telling you the truth, guys. I don't care how much you think, oh, I would never do that, I would never do that. If you're put in the wrong situation with the wrong woman and she's telling you all the right things, it's going to be a hard thing to walk away from. It's going to be a hard thing to get away. That's why you should just, just avoid it. Just don't even get anywhere near it. And especially if you don't have the Word of God in you, if you're simple, if you're void of understanding, you will yield every time. At least if you have the words of God, at least if you're filled with the Spirit, it's possible, but it's not probable. That's why you should just avoid this woman. It says, He goeth after her straightway, as an ox goeth to the slaughter, or as a fool to the correction of the stocks. We see this guy isn't just like, Oh, uh, I don't know. No, he's going straight way. Why? Because it's such a powerful thing. When a woman's telling you everything you want to hear, man, there's just something inside man. There's something in a red-blooded man that's just like, I'm going to go. That's why you just go to avoid this situation. And he goes straight way to the slaughter. <laughs> I, don't, I grew up in Texas, so there's a lot of ox. There's a lot of cattle. And they're just all in this big, you know, uh, pen and they're just all just going right to the slaughter. And they're just like running. They're just herding. They're just going straight to it. They don't know what's happening. I mean, do you think if the cow realized, look, there's this rod that's going to be shoved into my head. And I'm going to be stunned. And then they're going to slit my throat. And blood's just going to pour out. That they'd just be running straight to it? <laughs> of course not. They would be like, no, I'm getting out of here. But they're just heading straight for death and destruction. And just as much as that dumb cow is going to be stunned in the head, what happens? He's rendered where he can't do anything. A young man that gets in this woman's situation and she whispers in his ear, it's like the metal rod getting struck through your brain. And you're just rendered useless. And then she's going to slit your throat and the life's going to come out of you. Just like this dumb animal. That's why you need to have the... And you know, God will give you a, a way of escape. 
If you read his word, if you study his word, I don't believe that a young man is just going to be walking down the street and just stumble into the sin. No, he's going he's gonna to say, hey, I kind of know where that girl's at. Hey, would it, would it be cool if I just kind of talked with her for a little bit? Oh man, this woman came on to me. Maybe I should give her a little time of day. That's a slippery slope, my friend. And this woman knows what she's doing. She knows how to get your ear. So it's still a dart strike through his liver, as the bird hasteneth to the snare, and knoweth not that it is for his life. Let's turn to uh, Proverbs chapter 22. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, the Bible says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. It's so important to train your young men, to train your daughters, to not just avoid this situation so that they'll be anchored to something. When this young woman comes and entices, you know, all the other guys with this big dumb animal, they're just going to go. They're just going to go. And there's nothing holding them back. They're just going to keep going to the death and destruction. But when you have the Word of God, maybe you get a little enticed, but you're going, and then all of a sudden, oh, oh, I'm anchored by the Word of God. Oh, I'm anchored by what the Lord said. Oh, I should flee fornication. Oh, I should flee that flattery. Oh, I should flee the lips of the strange woman. But you're not going to get that unless you have the Bible. And that's why it's so important to train your children. That's why it's so important to train your daughters. So they have that anchor. So they have something that could pull them back. Now, unfortunately, even men could, you know, take off that anchor and just throw it away. But the Bible gives a promise that says, if you train up a child in the way he should go, when he is old, he will not depart from it. And if we go back to Proverbs chapter 7, 7 verse uh, 23, at the end of that it says, as a bird hasteneth to the snare. Now when a bird, you know, I, I've, I've seen some people catch birds, they have this big trap. And then they set all this food like acorns or whatever in the bottom of this trap. Now when this bird comes and flies down and walks into that trap at first and sees that delicious food, what is he thinking? Is he thinking he's about to die? Is he thinking about a death and destruction and bondage and wickedness? No. He's just like, hey, that looks really good. I want this food. It's just sitting right there. It's so easy. It's so great. And that's what this strange woman is. She's so easy. It just looks so good. It's the low-hanging fruit. And you say, oh man, I just want that. It looks so good. But he doesn't realize it's a trap. And you know what? The Bible says when it's looking for a virtuous, virtuous woman, who can find it? You're not going to just stumble across the virtuous woman super easy. She's not going to just be standing out there and be like, Oh man, it's right here. I got it so easy. No, the easy woman is the trap. The easy woman is the one you should not want. You need to look diligently. You need to look hard. You need to be looking for this virtuous woman because she's hard to find. And we'll finish this chapter. It says in verse 24, Hearken unto me now, therefore, O ye children, and attend to the words of my mouth. Let not thine heart decline to her ways, Go not astray in her paths, for she hath cast down many wounded. Yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. Turn, if you would, to uh, Judges chapter 19. It'll be the last place that we turn. So we see that at the end of this, he's saying, what? Hearken unto me now, therefore, ye children, and attend to the words of my mouth. How are you going to avoid this strange woman? By God's Word. It's the words that matter. Words are going to affect where you go in this life. Words are going to determine if you're going to be affected by this strange woman. So what is it so important? Don't listen to the flattering lips of the strange woman. You know, a lot of times men think that it's just the way a woman looks. But have you ever seen an attractive woman or a woman that was pleasing to the eyes and then she had just the most annoying, weirdest voice or laugh and it was just an immediate turn on. You're like, oh man, like I think of Fran Dresser, she's some, you know, wicked, horrible actress, but she has the most annoying, horrible voice. She just sounds like a dying cat or something, and it's just so unappealing. <laughs> Why? Because the words mean something. And you know, guys don't necessarily understand this, but words are very attractive unto men. That's why God contrasts a godly one with a meek and quiet spirit. And she contrasts the, the loud and stubborn one. You know, and sometimes it might be appealing to your flesh to go up to that easy, that loud, stubborn woman. But ultimately, that's not really what guys want in their heart. They want that quiet. They want that meek woman. Who's gonna, you know, that's what's attractive to them. They don't want to have to, you know, fight with some woman. They don't want to have to wrestle for the pants who's going to wear them. They just want to know, hey, this woman's going to be subject unto me. And you know, a wife will give you the flattery that you need. A wife will build you up. A wife will satisfy you. 
And you don't want that cheap substitute of that strange woman flattering with her words. You need to get the words of God written on your heart so you're not affected by her words. And we not to just realize that obviously physical you know, appearance makes a big deal to men, but the words really matter. And young women, you need to understand that a guy is going to be attracted to you by the words that come out of your mouth. If you had several women lined up and you were attracted to all of them, what would separate them? The words that come out of their mouth. Words are very important. It has such, so much to do with attractiveness. Even you men, even what comes out of your mouth. If you want to get that woman, you need to have pleasant things coming out of your mouth. You need to be praising the woman that you're desiring. You need to be saying good things. You need to be paying attention to what comes out of your mouth if you want to attract that woman. Said in, uh, Let not thine hearts decline to her ways, go not astray to her paths, for she hath cast down many wounded. Yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. Many strong men have been slain by this, this strange woman. We see so many strong men of God. David, Solomon, Samson, Adam. So many strong men. What? They're enticed by the strange woman. It's such a powerful thing that can even affect God's people. And we need to make sure. God's repeating in chapter 5. He's saying in chapter 6. He's saying in chapter 7. Young men, pay attention to the words of the strange woman. Don't get enticed. Don't look at that flattery as a good thing. No, you need to reject that flattery. You need to remove yourself from that flattery. Because that's just the first step. That's just the way to hell, to death, to destruction, to misery, to grief, to divorce, to fornication, to adultery, to, to all kinds of things. In today's world, it can go so far. You can get an STD. You can get anything. You could even have abortion when you didn't want it. When you go to this strange woman, she has the power to influence you to go straight way after her. Then she has the power to kill your child without your say. Because we live in such a backwards world. This is such an evil world wicked road that can lead to all kinds of harm. And it starts with the words. So we're going to look at this last place. I'll, I'll read you one other verse. It's 1 Peter chapter 5. It says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Now I talked about this as a woman. She didn't necessarily know that she was deceiving this guy. Maybe she's subtle of heart. One moment she wanted her husband. She thought that that was the guy she wanted. But then she realized, oh no, I, I want this guy. And so she moves on to adultery. And then she's like, oh man, that guy wasn't satisfying. She moves on to the next guy. And this attire of the harlot, this strange woman, she's never satisfied. And we'll go to Judges chapter 19 and I'll finish. It says, And it came to pass in those days, when there was no king in Israel, that there was a certain Levite sojourning on the side of Mount Ephraim, who took to him a concubine out of Bethlehem, Judah. And his concubine played the whore against him. And went away from him under her father's house to Bethlehem, Judah. And was there four whole months. And I think Judges chapter 19 is a pretty famous chapter. Not a positive chapter. Now this woman, she travels with her husband unto another town. And we see that the town is filled with sons of Belial. Who come around the house, around the house, and they say they want to lie with the man. And in an effort just to satisfy them, just to appease them for that one moment, they give unto him the concubine. And it says that they abused her all the night to where she laid on the doorstep dead. Now the, the, the truth is that God will punish whoredom. That God is a revenger. That God is going to pay for every sin. And these women and these men need to understand that when you play the whore, some wicked sin can come upon you. You know, and I hate reading that story sometimes because you read it and you're like, man, this is so wicked, this is so evil. And nobody ever deserves to have be forced. To be you know, taken advantage of. To be just destroyed. But we see that God's wrath and judgment will come upon those that play the whore. Be not deceived. If you decide to go after this woman, if you decide to hearken unto her lips, God will rain up and cloud on you. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he reap. Let's bow our heads and close, our, and close in prayer. Thank you God for just reiterating this point once again. That it's so important for us to be fixated on your words, not the words of the strange woman. That it's so important that we just flee fornication. That we just avoid certain situations. That we not think ourselves too highly. That we wouldn't be affected or tempted in any way. But that we would just take your wisdom. That we would have the understanding. We wouldn't just be simple minded. And we would just avoid our house. We would avoid by our way. We would avoid our lips. That we would look for the quiet 
and meek woman. I pray for every woman, that any woman that's hearing my voice, that they would understand what they should be like. That they should not dress in the attire of a harlot, and they should not look for this guy that's just chasing after the strange woman. That they should look for a righteous man. And by his words and by her words, people would understand what kind of people they were and who they wanted to marry. And I pray that uh, we would all understand the seriousness of this sin and that we would just completely avoid it. I pray that you just be with all those that are traveling to uh, South Africa, that you'd be with them, that your hand of protection would be on them. From the wicked men, from the adulterers, from this Gigaba, from South Africa, from anybody that would want to harm them. They, they would be like Jeremiah and they'd be a defense city and that you'd watch over them. Thank you so much for this church and everyone in this room. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.